A strong hold over current affairs is crucial for aspirants to succeed in the UPSC Civil Services examination. Administer your preparation with updated and relevant news with the monthly current affairs revision program. Starting from 20th September at 5 p.m., the 60 dedicated classes offer detailed topic-wise coverage of important news compiled through authentic sources such as The Hindu, Indian Express, PIB, Yojana among others. Enhance your knowledge with up-to-date contextual understanding of all current affairs, expert support through personal mentoring, assessment through MCQs and means-oriented questions, doubt clearing sessions, student portal access hello and thank you for tuning into this edition of news today without delay let's have a look at the headlines first central drugs standard control organization drug alert list reveals widespread issues of drug quality across india armed forces special powers act extended to parts of nagaland and arunachal pradesh prime minister launches Three Param Rudra supercomputers and high performance computing system. India signs agreement on marine biodiversity of areas beyond national jurisdiction at United Nations General Assembly. 50 years of Indian microfinance sector. World Intellectual Property Organization released Global Innovation Index 2024 report. In a significant development, the Central Drug Standard Control Organization has issued a drug alert shedding light on widespread issues of drug quality across India. According to the alert, samples of more than 50 drugs, including commonly used medications like paracetamol, pandy, calcium and vitamin D3 supplements, have been found to be not of standard quality. Now, this issue doesn't stop here. The alert also points out that several states have failed to submit crucial data on drug quality, which raises concerns about transparency and accountability in the regulation process. So how are drugs regulated in India? Well, drug regulation in the country is governed by the Centrally Enacted Drugs and Cosmetics Act of 1940, TC Act, and the corresponding Drugs and Cosmetics Rules of 1945. The CDSCO, headed by the Drug Controller General of India, is responsible for the continuous monitoring of drugs across the nation. In fact, it releases a note of standard quality list every month to assess the quality and safety of drugs available in the market. And that's not all. The National Pharmaceutical Pricing Authority plays a key role too. It is tasked with fixing and revising the prices of controlled bulk drugs and monitoring their availability. If there are any shortages, the NPPA steps in to address them. However, since public health is a state subject, state government undertakes drug regulation by state drug regulating agencies. But there are several challenges when it comes to drug regulation in India. For instance, there is uneven implementation of regulations. Some fixed-dose combinations banned by the DCGI are still being licensed for manufacturing under state units, creating inconsistencies. Moreover, the discretion of officers in enforcing the regulation is another issue, as the DC Act and rules don't provide specific metrics to guide their decisions. Then, there is the problem of inadequate trained personnel, which was highlighted by the Mashilkar Committee back in 2003. Additionally, a lack of coordination between the SDRAs and the central authorities coupled with insufficient infrastructure and funding further complicates the situation. So now, what can be done to improve this ecosystem? Experts suggest that using technology can be a game-changer. For instance, encouraging the use of digital software like XLN across all states could streamline services and enhance efficiency. Another key recommendation is the creation of a national drug authority by the Mashilkar Committee which could help overhaul the structure of drug regulation in India. Lastly, there is a need for the implementation of recall orders. Currently, there is no system in place to ensure that substandard drugs are recalled from the market effectively. In a recent development, the Ministry of Home Affairs has extended the Armed Forces Special Powers Act or AFSPA to parts of Nagaland and Arunachal Pradesh for a period of six months. This extension has been made under Section 3 of AFSPA, declaring these areas as disturbed, thus necessitating the continued deployment of the armed forces to aid civil authorities. 
Currently, AFSPA is in force across parts of Nagaland, Assam, Manipur and Arunachal Pradesh. In Jammu and Kashmir, a similar law, the Armed Forces JNK Special Powers Act 1990, remains operational. The primary objective of AFSPA is to grant special powers to the armed forces in disturbed areas, particularly in the northeastern states. Under Section 3, the central government or the state's governor can declare any region a disturbed area where the use of armed forces becomes essential. Notably, disturbed area is an area where use of armed forces in aid of civil power is necessary. Section 4 confers sweeping powers to the military, allowing them to use force or fire upon individuals acting in violation of the law after giving due warning. Furthermore, the Act allows for arrests without a warrant on reasonable suspicion. Crucially, under AFSPA, army personnel are protected from prosecution for actions taken during operations, unless explicitly authorized by the central government. Despite its intent, AFSPA has faced widespread criticism. It is often accused of violating fundamental rights, including right to equality, freedom and life enshrined in Articles 14, 19 and 21 of the Indian Constitution. The law has also come under fire for contravening international standards such as Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Additionally, critics argue that AFSPA undermines state autonomy even during peaceful times. Many experts, including the Jeevan Reddy Committee 2004, have recommended repealing AFSPA and incorporating relevant provisions into the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act 1967. A more grassroots-driven governance model could also help reduce conflict in these regions, empowering local communities. In a prominent boost to India's technological infrastructure, Prime Minister Narendra Modi today launched three new Param Rudra supercomputers along with high-performance computing systems. Developed indigenously under the National Supercomputing Mission or NSM and worth Rs 130 crore, these cutting-edge supercomputers have been deployed at major scientific institutions in Pune, Delhi and Kolkata. In Pune, the giant meter radio telescope will now explore astronomical phenomena like fast radio bursts. At the Inter-University Accelerator Centre in Delhi, the new system will advance research in material science and atomic physics. Meanwhile, the SN Bose Centre in Kolkata will facilitate groundbreaking work in physics, cosmology and earth sciences. Additionally, the Prime Minister also launched two high-performance computing systems named Arka and Arunika. Supercomputers are the most powerful mainframe systems in existence capable of solving highly complex computations by dividing tasks into multiple parts and processing them in parallel. Their speed is measured in flops, floating point operations per second. The National Supercomputing Mission or NSM launched in 2015 is a joint initiative between the Department of Science and Technology and the Ministry of Electronics and IT. It aims to provide India with advanced supercomputing infrastructure, addressing the computational needs of academia, researchers, MSMEs and startups. It is implemented by Centre for Development of Advanced Computing or CDAC, Pune and the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. Wrapping up, Centre for Development of Advanced Computing established in 1988 is a premier research and development organisation under the Ministry of Electronics and IT. It has been instrumental in delivering the Param series of supercomputers, including India's first Giga scale system, the Param 8000 in 1990, followed by the Param 10000 in 1998. Moving ahead, India has made a significant move in global marine conservation by signing the Agreement on Marine Biodiversity of Areas Beyond National Jurisdiction, also known as the High Seas Treaty at the United Nations General Assembly. This landmark treaty formerly known as Biodiversity Beyond National Jurisdiction Agreement was adopted in the year 2023 by the Intergovernmental Conference on Marine Biodiversity. The Ministry of Earth Sciences will be responsible for implementing the agreement here in India. Now, let's dive deeper into what this treaty entails. 
This agreement on marine biodiversity of areas beyond national jurisdiction or the High Seas Treaty is an international treaty under the framework of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. The treaty's primary aim is the conservation and sustainable use of marine biodiversity in areas beyond national borders. One of the key features of the agreement is the demarcation of marine protected areas in biodiversity rich zones of the oceans that are under stress from human activities such as overfishing and pollution. The treaty prohibits parties from exercising sovereign rights over the marine resources derived from these high seas. So why is this significant for India? First and foremost, it enhances India's strategic presence beyond its exclusive economic zone, allowing us to play a vital role in global ocean governance. Additionally, it contributes to achieving sustainable development goals, especially SDG 14, which focuses on life below water. The treaty will also bolster India's ongoing marine conservation efforts and open up new avenues for scientific research and development in unexplored ocean regions. Another noteworthy aspect of the treaty is its recognition of the importance of traditional knowledge alongside scientific expertise. The High Seas Treaty addresses four main areas. First, marine genetic resources ensuring fair and equitable sharing of benefits derived from these resources. Second, area-based management tools, establishing marine protected areas to safeguard critical habitats. Third, environmental impact assessments, ensuring that activities in the high sea do not cause undue harm to marine ecosystems. And fourth, capacity building and transfer of marine technology, supporting developing nations in marine conservation through access to technology and expertise. Now, let's better understand UNCLOS. It is an international convention adopted in 1982 and came into force in 1994, which laid down a comprehensive regime of law and order in world's oceans and seas. Now, you might be wondering what exactly are the high seas? International law defines the high seas as all parts of the ocean that do not fall within the exclusive economic zone, territorial sea, or internal waters of any country or in archipelagic waters of an archipelagic country. This means high seas and associated resources are not directly owned or regulated by any country. Remarkably, the high seas make up 64% of the world's oceans, which is why this treaty is such a game changer for marine conservation. This year marks a significant milestone in India's financial journey, 50 years of the Indian microfinance sector. In 1974, India's first microfinance institution, Self-Employed Women's Association Bank, was registered as a cooperative bank. Soon after, in 1976, Nobel laureate Mohammed Yunus revolutionized microfinance further with the establishment of the Grameen Bank in Bangladesh, laying the foundation of modern MFIs. The Reserve Bank of India regulates MFIs in India, and in 2010, the Maligam Committee recommended a holistic framework to regulate NBFC MFIs, ensuring transparency and protecting borrower interests. Today, microfinance institutions play a crucial role in financial inclusion, offering small value loans to those who are traditionally excluded from formal banking services. These loans can be used for savings, fund transfers, and even micro-insurance providing a much-needed safety net for the poor. But why is the microfinance sector so significant? It is more than just a financial tool. It is a potent tool for financial inclusion and socio-economic transformation, especially in rural areas. By extending credit to individuals who lack collateral to access to formal banking, MFIs empower people, particularly women, through self-help groups. This contributes not only to poverty reduction, but also to the overall development of rural economies. However, the sector faces its share of challenges. One of the biggest issues is the high transaction cost involved in providing services to a large number of small borrowers. Moreover, absence of collateral makes it difficult to secure offered loans. These institutions often charge higher interest rates than commercial banks due to the risk involved and the difficulty in securing cheap funding further adding to the credit cost for borrowers. Other hurdles include low financial and digital literacy among borrowers, many of whom continue to rely on money lenders for loans. In response to these challenges, the Indian government has taken several steps to strengthen the microfinance ecosystem. 
The SHG Bank Linkage Program encourages self-help groups to shift their focus from non-income generating activities to production-based activities, increasing their loan volumes of SHGs and by modifying their money lending and financial viability. Additionally, the Pradhan Mantri Mudra Yojana launched in 2015 provides loans of up to 10 lakh rupees to non-corporate, non-farm, small and micro enterprises through commercial banks, NBFCs, etc. These loans are categorized into three groups: Shishu, Kishore, and Tarun, based on the stage of the business. The 2024 Union Budget even enhanced the loan limit under the Tarun category from rupees 10 lakh to rupees 20 lakh for those who have successfully repaid their loans. offering greater financial flexibility to small business owners the world intellectual property organization or wipo has just released the global innovation index 2024 report a critical tool that helps governments assess innovation led social and economic changes it is co-published by wipo cornell university and insead business school The GII measures innovation using key criteria including institutions, human capital, infrastructure, credit, investment, knowledge creation and creative outputs. In the latest rankings, Switzerland once again maintained its top position followed by Sweden, the US and Singapore. India has also shown notable progress, climbing to 39th position among 133 global economies, improving from 40th last year. Even more impressive, India ranks first among lower middle income economies and the Central and Southern Asia region in knowledge and technology outputs, creative outputs and business sophistication. India's key strengths include ICT services export, venture capital received and intangible asset intensity. This year's GII theme shines a spotlight on the growing significance of social entrepreneurship. Social entrepreneurship involves developing innovative solutions to tackle social and environmental challenges, often without profit as a primary goal. In terms of its significance, it contributes approximately dollar 2 trillion to global GDP and generates employment for an estimated 30 million social entrepreneurs worldwide and an estimated 10 to 11 million social enterprises. It will also address issues like poverty, environmental damage and social injustice. Wrapping up, WIPO headquartered in Geneva, Switzerland, is a specialized agency of the United Nations, established in 1967. With 193 members including India since 1975, WIPO aims to create a balanced intellectual property system that fosters creativity and innovation. India is a member of major IP treaties like Paris Convention for the Protection of Industrial Property 1998, Bern Convention for the Protection of Literary and Artistic Works 1928, and the Patent Cooperation Treaty 1998. In today's personality in news, we will discuss Shahid Bhagat Singh, remembered on his birth anniversary. Born in Lyallpur, Western Punjab, India, which is now in Pakistan, he was influenced by revolutionary socialism, Marxism, and communism ideals. In terms of his key contributions, he founded Naujawan Bharat Sabha in 1926. In 1928, he changed the name of Hindustan Republican Association to Hindustan Socialist Republican Association. In 1929, he and Batukeshwar Dutt bombed Central Legislative Assembly in Delhi to oppose Public Safety Bill and Trade Dispute Bill while raising the slogan Inkalab Zindabad. His works include Why I Am an Atheist and Autobiographical Discourse. the jail notebook etc he displayed values of patriotism courage strength of conviction and more as we wrap up today's bulletin let's have a look at some quick updates union minister of communications recently held a meeting with bharat 6g alliance to strengthen india's home grown 6g ecosystem bharat 6g alliance is an alliance of domestic industry academia national research institutions and standards organizations facilitated by the government India has been elected to steering committee of Global Operational Network of Anti-Corruption Law Enforcement Authorities Network or GLOB. It was established in 2021 at UN General Assembly special session against corruption. Ministry of Labor and Employment signed an MOU with Amazon for 2 years to leverage NCS portal for boosting job opportunities. NCS portal is an online portal launched in the year 2015. 
China test fired intercontinental ballistic missile into Pacific Ocean for the first time in decades. ICBMs were first deployed by United States in 1959. ICBMs can travel more than 5500 kilometers. Karnataka government rejected report of the high level working group on Western Ghats 2013 headed by Dr K Kasuri Rangan. It recommended 37% of the total area of Western Ghats as eco-sensitive area making a number of projects or activities eco-destructive. Despite protests from India, Brazil, Indonesia and US, European Union will go ahead with the implementation of its European Union Deforestation Regulation from December 30, 2024. EUDR entered into force in 2023. It aims to curb global forest degradation and deforestation, protect biodiversity and reduce GHG emissions by placing new obligations on companies that import, export or sell certain products in EU. A rare weather phenomenon left waste thousands of trees in Etur Nagaram Wildlife Sanctuary. It is one of the oldest sanctuaries situated in Varangal, Telangana and it was established in 1953. Disaster struck in Bihar during participation in Jeevit Putrika festival in Bihar. It is a Hindu festival observed primarily in Bihar, Uttar Pradesh, Jharkhand and Nepal. Before we sign off, let's challenge your understanding in today's installment of Test Your Knowledge. Thank you for joining us. We hope you found this episode of News Today engaging. For the solution to the quiz and to access the PDF version of News Today, remember to visit the provided links in the description below.